This is Todd Coburn of Cal Poly Pomona with Arrow 3261, Lecture 21 on Mohr Circle and extending further ideas into transformation of stresses. Last time we talked a little bit about tensor notation and we were reminded for a three-dimensional state of stress we can represent those stresses with the stress tensors. Sigma XX, Sigma YY, Sigma ZZ are all normal stresses. Stress on the X face and the X direction and so on. Also, whenever we see that Sigma XX as we've discussed in the past, it's often customary to simplify that when the subscript is repeated to just call it Sigma X rather than Sigma XX where it's implying that the stress is on both the X face and in the X direction. So we see a little three-dimensional element with a general state of stress here with tensor notation shown on each one. We saw last time that we can rotate our little element uh, at any angle and we will see that those stresses, both the normal stresses and the shear stresses, change. And we got an equation to calculate that for a plane state of stress. We saw that a plane state of stress is when one of the faces of the element uh, or one of the pairs of the three pairs of faces have a zero stress. And if all of our loads apply in the plane and our element has no stress out of that plane, that can give us a state of plane stress. There are also three-dimensional problems like this little rod where a three-dimensional part with a uh, plane stress uh, kind of condition can also provide a plane stress condition. For example, a little element shown in figure 7-4 of Beer and Johnson. We see that the stresses from the F1 and the F2 are all in a plane and we have one unloaded face or non-stressed face that's perpendicular to the surface of the rod and therefore that also falls in, in, under the idea of a plane stress state. Our aircraft is full of many parts and while they're all 3D many of these can be broken down into simple one and two directional kind of stresses. However there are uh, elements that need a three-dimensional state of stress, but there are also many that undergo a plane stress state like the skins and bulkheads and things like this and floor beams. So once again a state of plane stress is when we have one face that is unstressed and the element is rather thin. So this is reminding us that when our our sign convention for beams is chopping off the beam moving from left to right but when we're dealing with shear stresses on a little incremental element for the purposes of stress transformations we generally define positive uh, following this sign convention shown here which is like a right hand rule basically the idea is if you look at figure 7 5 of Beer and Johnson the A one here you see that the tau well, the, the sigma x is in the x direction, therefore it's positive. And in the negative x direction, it's shown in the negative direction, therefore it's positive. In the positive y, it's shown positive. In the negative y, it's shown negative. Therefore, that is a positive stress state showing tension, 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 tension. However, for the shear stress, you see, for example, focusing on tau xy, you see if we look at the so that our element has one cut one edge along the positive x face and one along the negative x face and if you look on the positive x face that shear stress is pointing in the positive y direction if you look on the negative x face it's pointing in the negative x direction therefore it is defined as positive following a right hand rule kind of convention and following that convention we then can apply our stress transformation equations to calculate the stresses in the inclined uh, here it's shown as x prime and y prime but we could call it the one and the two directions and in the tau one two direction 
So once again, the angle, positive angle, means we're taking the x-axis we started with and we're rotating upward from that. Okay. So once again, last time we saw a state of plane stress on a thin element. We saw that one edge was free. We got these two transformation equations, which gives us the normal and shear stresses for any angle, and now we're calling that angle phi. We can calculate the angle at which the max principal stresses occur. Once again, our max principal stresses, sigma 1 is the maximum stress, sigma 2 is the minimum stress. So when you rotate to this phi p angle, you will find one of the elements, the one that uh, rotated to that angle, will be the max stress, and the corresponding stress at 90 degrees to that will be the minimum stress. If we calculate the angle at which the maximum shear stress occurs, we use the second equation here, and that may or may not also have a normal stress. If it does, it will be that average stress value. And that shear stress is going to be 45 degrees away from where the angle of the max principal stresses occur. Once again, we saw these were our principal stress equations where the first term is our average stress and the second term is our shear stress. And a lot of times we'll just write that shear stress equation separately, but it's really just a subpiece. Today we're going to be looking at this. We already know how to transform our stresses and we're going to be exploring that further in our homework after today. But we also are going to look at a cute little uh, clever method of evaluating stresses uh, that's related to these principal stresses today. So if we look at our two stress transformation equations and look at how they apply to a element, we can find, uh, if you are good at calculus, you can find a clever manipulation of this says we can write the equation this way as shown about the middle of the page here. And if you're very familiar with calculus and circles, you might know, notice that these are just the equations of a circle. This is the average stress. This is the shear stress. And these are the equations of a circle such that we can plot the stress state for all angles of rotation as if it were just a circle on a flat play page. For example, take a look at our figure here to the right, Beer and Johnson's figure 7-7. Seven, seven. We see plotting if we plot the shear stress on the vertical axis and the normal stress on the horizontal axis, then we find that the center of this circle is located at that point of average stress. What we're saying here is the principal stress equation which was solved by finding the, the roots where the sigma and tau of those first two equations are max and are minimum, max and minimum, those equations happen to have the parametric equations of a circle. And we find an interesting thing. If we plot shear stress versus normal stress as we see to the right, any place where we have a principal stress, remember the two principal stresses, sigma 1 and sigma 2, are associated with no shear stress. That means those points Principal stresses, principal normal stresses will always fall right on the horizontal axis because there's no shear stress. So we see point A and point B are our two principal stresses. The average stress is just going to be falling right between them, smack dab in the middle. And since the shear stress is the half of the difference between those stresses squared plus the square of the shear stress squared of all that. What we find is point D and point E shown here are the two max principal shear stresses. Remember those are on a different rotation of the element. 
what we find is if we have the element rotated such that we have a principal stress state, the principal stresses, then we would get the stresses that are shown as points A and B. If we then rotate the element from that point, that plane, that angle of rotation where that maximum and minimum occurred, we would find that that normal stress drops off, as you see, by moving upwards and around the circle from point A toward point D. So at point M, we're going to have a normal stress and a shear stress. The shear stress is on the vertical axis, the normal stress is on the horizontal axis. And what we see is this circle represents all potential stress states as you rotate that element through 360 degrees. As you rotate it, you go from a max principal stress state to a max shear stress state to a minimum principal shear state and onward. This is just a circle, this plots as a circle on a flat plane, and what we find is the center of that circle is located at that average stress. The radius of the circle is just the shear stress. And while this looks a little bit like hocus pocus, it makes it very easy to visualize our stresses, all potential stress states. This has been used, used successfully for a number of years, for a few decades, and uh, it's very handy. It was especially handy when we didn't have calculators as powerful as we do now. Because we have calculators that can do so much nowadays, it is less common to see folks plotting more circle in industry than it used to be. But this is still a pretty classical skill for understanding, writing stresses, and visualizing stresses, and therefore you should be able to understand the basics of Moore's circle. This is called Moore's circle because he's the guy that discovered this little trick. So once again there's a typical Moore's circle. Our equation is of this form. Our key values are the average stress and the shear stress. Where the average stress is the center of the circle and the shear stress is the radius of the circle. Remember our principal stresses are given by this equation and the angle of rotation of where that occurs is given by the second equation. And the way that positive is defined is moving from the x-axis of where we started, moving in a positive clockwise direction toward the y, that's how that plane is defined. Once again that's our max shear stress and our shear stress can be calculated by just plugging into the second equation for theta s or you can just note that it's 45 degrees off from our principal stress plane. So how do we show our stresses with Mohr's circle? Well it's actually rather simple. It's especially simple if we're starting from a principal stress state. If we start with a principal stress state we're just going to draw our horizontal and vertical axes, plot our two principal stresses strike a curve and uh, that gives us everything. If we have a more general stress state like the sh one shown in figure 712a with sigma x, sigma y and tau xy then it's a little more work but it's not too bad and here's how it works. We're going to get the average stress by just taking this uh, the average of sigma x and sigma y. We're going to get the radius of that by calculating the shear stress from all of those values. We see that the max and min will just be that, obviously, and that's our angle. This is our sign convention for shear stresses. If our shear stress is pulling that, that normal stress downward in a clockwise fashion, we're going to show that above the axis as shown here. If it's pulling in the other direction, we're going to plot it below the axis. So what does that mean? Well, it means we're going to take our shear stress state. We've got sigma x. We're going to come along the horizontal axis. So we're coming, we're saying, okay, starting with sigma x, we see we've got, we come on this axis out until we get to sigma x. And then we see that this is rotating our element this way. Therefore, it's going to be plotted below the axis. So now we're going to go down by the amount of the shear stress and we get this point. And if we move to the negative and negative, which is negative positive, 
that strikes the diameter of our circle that tells us where the average is you see that now that we have those two points of the circle we can just if you were doing this graphically you could just take your compass and strike the curve and that would tell you where your two principal stresses are it's actually easiest to find those two principal stresses just plug into our principal stress equation and then plot those two directly but we can also do it this way does that make sense we now see that our principal stresses are here at point A and here at point B our max shear stresses are plus and minus this you see because this equation here says your shear stress is the max stress minus the min stress over 2 and then that means for any given orientation it's this component squared plus this component squared the square root of all that gives you this component which when it's oriented like this gives you the max and the min shear stresses Now if we had a principal straight it's even easier because then what we find is we just say oh well if we have a principal straight we just take this guy and plot him take this guy and plot him and now we have no shear stress on those two faces that gives us the diameter and that means this minus this over 2 gives us what these two values are and then you sketch in a circle that gives us all the magnitudes we need right once again take a look at this this is just our average stress and if we have other stress states we can do the same thing so let's uh, practice a little bit let's say we have a uniaxial load well our stress if you imagine our little element here in the middle of the part our stress is just P over A as you see calculated over here our stress is P over A and therefore we're gonna get P over A on the X face and that's gonna give us this point and then we see in the Y direction our stress is zero so that's right here that's our second point and now we can calculate the max shear stress is this minus this this value minus that value divided by 2 and that gives you the max shear stress and it occurs at the average stress which is this stress plus 0 over 2 so it occurs right here at sigma average this radius is simply tau this is the max tau and this is the min tau which is just plus and minus of the same value see how quick that is now once we have those two values we see it's easy to see not only that our principal stresses are this P over A and 0 we also see our max shear stress is just Sigma 1 minus Sigma 2 over 2 so that already tells us what our max shear stress state is and since this was a principal shear uh, a principal stress state already we know that our max shear is going to be at 45 degrees from that and that gives us this value with the magnitude of we're at 45 degrees now our magnitude is going to be stress x minus stress y over 2 that's the magnitude uh, excuse me stress x plus stress y over 2 right the average shear stress that's what we're going to see like this and the shear stress is going to be that value given here right okay if we have torsion we can see that torsional stress a torsional stress as that sh little element shows is a if you look at this element right here torsion is TR over J it's going to give us this kind of shear stress right like we talked about weeks ago 
there is no normal stress on this, only shear stress. What does that mean? When we plot our stresses, remember we've got our horizontal, which is sigma, our vertical, which is tau. And we've got this stress. This is rotating the thing this way, so it's plotted down here. And this one over here on the other side is plotted up here because rotating the other way. So that's our negative and positive. We have zero normal stress, right? It's right where the normal stress is zero. That's what we see here. There's no normal stress. However, if you rotate that element, you will find a rotation 45 degrees from that, which will give you the principal stresses, which are shown here. So we just plot our two shear stresses and then strike our diameter, which tells us what these two values are. You can see for this particular element here, the average normal stress is zero because there's no normal stresses on it. There was no normal stresses, therefore this is a max shear stress state where there's no normal stress. But if we rotate the element, we will end up getting principal stresses, normal stresses on a face where there's no shear stresses. And that's going to occur at 45 degrees. Your book and actually really any elementary engineering text will have a good deal on more circle. It's worth reading that. Now if we have a general three-dimensional state of stress, then we get this equation here. That looks a lot more complicated and we're not going to mess with that. However, there are a few things we need to be able to understand about three-dimensional stress states. When you have a three-dimensional stress state, as shown here in figure 610 of Shanley, figure A, here is a principal stress state. You'll notice that all the stresses, those stresses that are shown looking right here, the stresses that are shown, there's no shear stresses. That means it's a principal, shear, uh, principal stress state. However, you'll notice if we focus on this part of the element, just look at the element this way, that element in that orientation has a rotation that has a max shear stress. And if we take another face, like the front face, that has a rotation that will have a max shear stress state. So what we end up seeing is there are these planes of max shear stress for each of those stress states going across the element in all directions like these. As well as an octahedral section where if you look like this, at this section like a, what is that, an eight-sided die or something? Six, 12-sided die? If you look at this face by connecting these points, you see that these three stresses are all pulling away from this. You get a shear stress on that. That's called the octahedral plane. So the average stress is just this, and the octahedral stress is just that. So we could say, well, what's the stress, what's the shear stress in this plane? If you look at these two stresses and you look at the plane they act on, then what is the max shear stress at some rotation along there? Well, that will be this stress minus that stress over 2. And if you look at these two stresses, these two normal stresses, and look at a rotation of that element, that will give you stress 1 minus stress 2 over 2. And if you look at the other two stresses, that will give you... So what you can do is when you have an element with a three-dimensional stress state, once you have your principal stresses, if they're principal stresses, you can be sure that the stress, the shear stress between those two will be the difference over 2. So this minus this over 2 gives us one shear stress. This minus this over 2 gives us another shear stress. And this minus this over 2 gives us the third shear stress. We also get an octahedral shear stress on this octahedral plane given by this value. Now we're going to look right here next and we're going to see there's a little trick to solving this readily for a three-dimensional stress state. And even though we're not going to do a lot with a 
three-dimensional stress state, we are going to do this. So if we get an element like this one where we have a three-dimensional principal stress state, all we have to do is order our stresses sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 from greatest to least. So if we have 50 KSI, 20 KSI, and 30 KSI, then that would be 1, 2, excuse me, 2, 3. If we have 50 minus 20, 30, then that would be 1, 2, 3. See how that works? So we order them from greatest to smallest, and we'll find the max shear stress will be this, the max minus the min over 2. Okay, this is a key principle that I expect you to know. It's rather simple, and even though you won't be using this a lot in industry, it kind of, uh, when you understand this, it kind of makes you own the whole more circle principle stresses, shear stresses thing better. So let's just practice. So while we're not going to go and calculate a whole bunch of three-dimensional stress states, we are expected to be able to calculate the shear stresses from a... Uh, principal three-dimensional stress state and we need to be able to plot the Mohr circle for any of these or plot the element stresses for any of these. So let's take a look at this little three-dimensional stress state. You take a look at it, do you see any shear stress? No, therefore this is a principal stress state. Therefore we can plot these stresses on the axes. So we look at the horizontal axis and we see since there's no shear stress on this face, this face, or this face, we just plot our three stresses, one, two, three. And then we take this minus this over two. That gives us this value. We take this minus this over two. The five minus the two over two. And that gives us these two shear stress values. And then this 10,000 minus 2,000 over 2. 10,000 minus 2,000 over 2. That gives us these two values. Now, if you're focused on just these two stresses, you're going to miss the maximum. You'll notice from this plot, we see, oh, we just plotted our 1, 2, 3 stresses. And the difference over 2 gives us that max that max and this one compared to the other the minor smallest one is the other max shear stress that gives us three shear stress planes you see that that's all there is to it if we have biaxial tension like this guy this is a little trickier we see this stress state it's 8,000 we come out 8,000 and then since that shear force is acting down we're going to plot that above the curve so we plot this point and the corresponding point down here, and that gives us this curve. We can also see that our this stress state here, this face here, has no shear stress. So actually that just plots directly minus 4,000. And then going from sigma 2 that we just found by rotating this circle, we can draw this circle, which gives us that value, and then go from the max to the min, and that gives us our third stress state. This is back to our uniaxial case. This is a, we see there's no shear stress on this face. So we plot that directly. There's no stress at all on that face. We plot that directly. This minus this over two gives us this value. And that gives us our circle. You'll notice we have the stress on the X face here. We have the stress on the Y face here. And we have the stress on the Z face here, right? The Z face is also zero. You see that? Now remember, we're using the XY subscripts. The reason we plot this on the x-axis, or on the horizontal axis, is not because this is in the x-direction. It's because there's no shear stress on this face. If there were shear stress, we would have had to go and plot it like this, and then plot a diameter again, okay? Rather than just dropping it straight on the axis. If we have compression, what we see now is we have a negative stress shown here, and our y and z faces are both zero. So we have two points here at zero, one from the y face and one from the z face. And this minus this over two gives us the max shear stress. That's our circle. Looking at our next little 
thing here. If we have uh, this stress state, what we see is sigma x is shown here. Boom, right there. Sigma y is the same as that, so we have a second point here. Sigma z is zero. Actually, let's uh, take a little side detour. Let's look over here a minute. Look at this element. Well, we have sigma x, sigma x is sigma y, and sigma z is sigma x. All three stresses are here. Sigma x is equal to sigma y is equal to sigma z. Therefore, what's the shear stress on this? Well, what's sigma x minus sigma x over two? It's zero. So because all these are the same, the difference is zero. That means the shear stresses are zero. For this element over here, we've got sigma x, sigma y. So between those two faces, between these two, there's going to be no rotation of that element that gives us any shear stress. But if we compare those stresses to this unloaded face, which is here at zero, we see we do get a shear stress off on that wacky off plane. If we have an element like this, once again, we plot our sigma x right there. Sigma y is negative sigma x, so that's right here. Sigma z is zero. So if we compare x to y, we get this circle. If we compare x to z, we get this circle. When we compare y to z, we get this circle. See that? Now this one over here has a shear stress. So we have one unloaded face, that's our z stress right here. And then we can go and say, well, we have a shear stress here and here from those faces with no normal stress. When we take that diameter and rotate it about, we find our two other normal stress states at a different rotation. If we look at this one right here, we see we have sigma x, that's got no shear stress, so it's plotted directly. We have sigma y, which is negative sigma x, that's plotted directly. And sigma z is also negative sigma x. So now there's no shear stress between the z and the y plane, but there is between the z and the x plane and between the z and uh, the y and the x plane. All right, we're going to look at some example problems. Some of these are ones we've already seen. We're going to kind of breeze through quickly the things we already studied and go right to the new material. We saw this element and we were looking for the principal stresses before. We already calculated the angle this way and the principal stresses that way. Here's the numbers showing the same thing. We did all this last time and this last time. Now that we have the normal stresses, it's rather easy to plot the Mohr circle of this guy. We would just plot a horizontal axis and a vertical axis. We would take this, plot that point. We take this, plot that point, and our third direction is zero. That's our sigma z. This is our first principal stress. So this principal stress minus zero over two gives us this Mohr circle and that max shear stress. Our z minus y gives us that minus max shear stress. And our x minus y gives us this max shear stress. Now on the next page we calculate our, shear, our max shear stress. That's this value. Because as we rotate, if you look at this element from here, from sigma uh, this is not sigma x, this is our principal stress. We'll call this sigma 1. This stress was actually 50 megapascal, 3, 4, 5. And then we went, since this is going up, that we're going to plot that below the axis. That's down here. That plots this point. And then we take, uh, we go to the other side of that. So go back, uh, plotting through that point, we get the other point for that circle. So as we take this element and rotate it like this, rotating that flat element like that, we get stresses along this. This was a three-dimensional element with this shear stress and this normal stress state. You see that? So really what we're doing here is plotting this element as we rotate it. Now, if we had taken this element and rotated from the y to the z, rotating this way about the x-axis, our yz, that would have been this little circle that represents all those rotations. If we take our, our uh, xz, 
rotating through here, x and z, that gives us this little angle. So this is the xz angle, this is the yz angle, and this is the xy angle. This says all stress states for xy rotations are rotating about z. This is all stress potential states for an xz rotation are rotating about y, and this is all for rotating uh, yz, which means about x. Make sense? This is calculating our shear stresses. We plotted those on the last slide. Here is another little example we saw this last time where we basically said, hey, we've got to cut a free body diagram. Uh, let's do that real quick. We did this before. Basically what we can do is take this thing like this. I think last time my pen stopped working while I was trying to draw this. What we have is this force. That means that is going to be reacted. If this is going this way, we're going to have a reaction like this on this face down here. And that means we're also going to get a twist. So that's going to be going to give us, we're going to get a reaction like this reacting that torque, that P times 18 torque. That's our torque due to it. That's our shear due to it. Is there anything else? Oh, and then we're going to get a moment. What moment do we get? We're going to get this moment where it's going to be reacted like this. This is our moment, which is actually P times 10, right? Then if you look at the lower piece, that means this torque is acting like this, this moment is acting like this, and this shear is acting like this. And that's the shear stress state that we used last time to go and look at this little element right here. So moving to the next slide, we're going to be continuing on with that line of thinking. Here is how we solve this last time. And now that we have our stresses, we can go and plug in this sigma x, which is zero, the sigma y, and the tau, and calculate our principal stresses. Or we could go directly to our Mohr circle, whichever we choose to do. This is showing how we calculate our principal stresses last time, and we can also calculate our Mohr, or determine our Mohr circle. For example, for this particular guy, if you wanted to plot your Mohr circle, all we would do is say, okay, this is our x or our sigma. This is our tau. What do we have? We have a max of 13, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. So about 13 something. And our min stress of minus 4, 2, 4, 6. So it's somewhere about here. This is sigma 1. This is sigma 2. And sigma 1 minus sigma 2 over 2 will give you what this shear stress is, the max and min shear stress. We also see we have an unloaded face. That means we're going to get two smaller circles. Like this, this is our sigma z. And if you take this minus this over 2, you get what that max shear stress is between those and this minus this over 2, you get what that max shear stress is. That's how we draw our Mohr circle. If we look at this example from Beer and Johnson, let's take a look first at our element and let's look at these two faces. We've got this stress 50 megapascals and we have this shear stress. Now that 50 megapascals corresponds with point F, and that shear stress of 40 megapascals is rotating this thing counterclockwise. Therefore, this shear stress will plot below. So we're going to come out 50 and down by 40, and that gives us this point. We then take the other stress, which is... Uh, negative 10 and the shear on this face is rotating it in a clockwise manner so that's going to be plotted above so we go negative 10 and we go up 40 plot above that gives us this point that gives us the diameter of this circle now we can use trig to find the center or use a compass to strike our circle 
and that identifies our two principal stresses. See how that works? These are the equations that we might use. Here once again, this is just calculating the numbers. We could have also, it might be simpler, to first just calculate our principal stresses and having done that, plot those two principles, calculate the max shear, plot that, and then just draw our circle. Where is our shear stress on the Z face? Well, the normal stress is here. That means the shear stress is associated with the Z face will be like this. Now, a lot of times when we're, when we're showing more circle, we're just looking at the plane stress state and we ignore the out of plane stress. It's very common to do. However, if I ask you to draw the 3D more circle, I'm going to expect to see everything. Does that make sense? And this is just continuing on more analysis of the same. Here's another little example. If we take a look at this, we see once again, we've got a hundred megapascal stress and the stress, the shear stress on that face is rotating clockwise. Therefore, it's gonna plot above the axis. So we come out here 100 and up 48. We then use the other shear stre uh, normal stress, 60. So we come out here 60 the shear stress on that face is rotating it counterclockwise, so that's going to plot below the axis. That gives us this point. Now we have everything we need to strike our curve. Or we can just plug into the principal stress equation, calculate sigma 1, sigma 2, and tau max, and plot this point, this point, and this point, and we're done. That probably is even easier. This is more of the same, and this is more of the same. And that's all I have for you. Make sure you understand all this. This is some of the hardest material we're covering. Drawing those more circles should become fairly easy. Now, especially if we just are given principal stresses or calculating principal stress, then just drawing the circle. If you try to take a shear and normal stress combo and draw your circle, you're going to struggle more. It might be easier just to plug into the principal stress equations, get your principal stresses, tau, uh, sigma 1, sigma 2, and tau, and then plot your curve. Enjoy.